And there we go. We are live. And hopefully uh, we'll have a handful more people pop in as we uh, as we start and begin tonight. It is great seeing everybody. Uh, oh well, yes, I will, uh, I will. I will get to that when we go to prayer. So um, I will. I'm going to take this thing off just in case I need to put it back on real quick. But I also don't want that as a uh, noose around my neck at the moment. So he's taking his off. The uh, so I can uh, that way I, I don't, don't want to get I choked too feel much. Good. So, <laughs> I understand um, but uh, it is good having everybody tonight, and I, I'm very thankful it's cool outside. I will apologize, I did not turn the air on inside of the sanctuary like when I wanted to, um, but I thankfully did remember like an hour ago. I wanted to remember like. Three hours ago. We had a weird um, day though, because we had a little bit of an odd day today. She yes. Still got um, messed up. Uh, it ended up that we got an email uh, about ten forty-five today that Grace's school had to move to remote learning, um, and it was because they, um, whenever whenever they might have a case of COVID in like one of the classes they'll quarantine that class. Um, the thing is, we have, we have seven grades in one area, and they were like, you know, there gets to that breaking point where we would have kids at home, and we have kids at school, and we, we need to, we can't do both on remote and at home. So um, they decided that everybody got to go home for this week and next week, We'll be going back on, on that Monday, but um, very, very thankful that um, it, it was, it, from the email that we got, Grace is, Grace is fine. She's not in danger or anything like that. They just had to, they had to do that just to make sure everybody could keep learning. So um, that and she is 100% vaccinated, so we're not, we're not too worried um, on, on anything there, so. We are um, a little excited about sleeping later. Yes, we're going to sleep a little like bit later. Um, and Grace is at home. We're just super insanely extra cautious. That and she got on the phone with friends for like two hours. And I don't know about y'all. When I, when I was on a phone call when I was growing up, you had the phone up to the ear now, and now the phone is like far away, and you're doing a video call. Yeah, it's a video. And she was like painting her nails and, and all, so <laughs> who knows what the phone calls of the future will be like, so. Um, you need to know when your daughter got a teenager, how many different things she's going to be wanting. Oh, she? goodness. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready right now. I am 100% fully prepared for Grace to be in second grade. <laughs> I am, I'm 100% ready for that right now. You give me about another 20 years, and I will be sitting pretty and ready for high school. I'll be, I'll be there. I'm be good as you want to be. I will be, uh, I'll be ready for high school then. So yeah, yeah, it goes into warp speed when it gets hits high school. So, um, but uh, I, I did receive um, a prayer request today, and I also have an update. Um, this one comes from uh, Leslie. Leslie wanted her coworker Rebecca Kelly um, on the prayer list. Um, she uh, is dealing with both of her parents being in hospice care um, over the last few days. So um, being in hospice care, she knows she can lose her parents um, at any time. Um, her dad has dementia and um, doesn't with, with that there's complications as well so um, she lives in Oregon they're in separate locations so it, it's a really difficult uh, situation so please remember Rebecca Kelly in your prayers um, I also uh, got an update from Julia um, she is uh, still under doctor's care um, a little bit of good news about um, the uh, rattling in her lungs. The doctor said she didn't really hear that. 
and um, she's on some new meds and still going through treatment, has some more doctor's appointments in the coming days, but just continue to be praying for healing there and, and help. Um, also, we do need to remember the uh, high school in Winston-Salem um, that had the shooting today. Uh, one child or one person lost their life. I hadn't gone into the full details of, um, of all that was there. But um, please remember all of those that were involved there. I know it's got to be just heartbreaking um, going through all that. So um, a lot of things going on. Um, a lot of things we do need to pray about. Um, this evening, who else can we remember in our prayers? Yes. I saw on Facebook that Anna Gross's daughter, Ellie, Okay. they had lost Ellie's, Ellie's granddaughter in a car accident Saturday. Okay. The granddaughter's name is Peyton Jones. So the family of Peyton Jones. Okay. She was only 18. Mm, okay. Let's remember the family of Peyton Jones. This would be Anna Lee's great granddaughter. Great granddaughter. Yes, so she's Ellie's granddaughter. It would be Ellie's granddaughter. Okay. So let's remember the family of Peyton Jones, all of all of Anna Lee's family. Um, as they, they mourn this loss, um, 18, um, that, that's heartbreaking. Well, I've heard of a whole lot of them, but I don't know none of them. Mm -hmm. the, uh, I know we probably met Peyton at uh, funeral at some point in time. Um, anyone else we can remember? Please lift up all of our schools. Uh, if you've been around the if you've been around uh, 57 anytime around 8 o'clock or uh, 3 o'clock, you know all the traffic that goes on there. Um, please pray for, for safety there. Um, like I said, that you know, there's a lot of, lot of uh, tension in all of the traffic, and um, we're just praying for, for good and healthy schools and traffic patterns and, and all of that that goes on with uh, with our schools, so please be in prayer for those. Anyone else tonight? Let's remember these that have been mentioned as well as those that are on our hearts. Father God, as we come before you tonight, we are so grateful for the opportunity to gather together in your name to worship you and, Lord, to learn from you. We pray now that you would help us as, as we go and venture into your word we ask that you would guide and direct us as only you can, that we might learn and grow in knowledge and in wisdom. And Father, as we bow humbly before you, we praise you, and we worship your holy name, for you are God alone. And Lord, you are the maker of heaven and earth. You have us within your hands, guarding us and guiding us each and every day. And Lord, we thank you that your mercies are everlasting, that your grace sustains us each and every day. And humbly before you, we ask uh, that you would watch out over these requests that we lift up to you now for Julia, for healing for her, that she would have help and, and health. Uh, Father, for uh, this one that, that Leslie has mentioned, Rebecca, as she is dealing with uh, both of her parents in, in very poor health and uh, in both in hospice care, we pray that you would help and comfort them in this hour of need. Lord, for this school right down the road from us, um, we think of Winston so far away, but Lord, we know it's, uh, it's not that long of a drive. We pray for this school as they have suffered this loss and this tremendous um, event of having a, a shooter on campus we pray that you would give peace and help to all of those involved. We pray that you would give that grace to sustain these that have gone through so much. Father, for our, our schools as <coughs> children are back, we pray that they might be well, protected from all harm and protected from all sickness. We pray that you would keep them safe. 
for all of the traffic that goes on. Lord, I pray that level heads would prevail, that you would calm spirits. Lord, that you would help each and every class, each and every student, each and every teacher get through this year. Lord, we pray now also for all of these that we know are sick, for those within our families, for our friends that are battling COVID, that are struggling, that are might be in the hospital, might be at home. But Lord, we pray that you would send healing. Lord, we look to you now. We pray these things in Christ's precious and holy name. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles tonight, we're in Jonah chapter 2. Jonah chapter 2. We're going, uh, we're going on with our, our study and wrestling with the will of God. And tonight's lesson is uh, entitled, When God Takes You to the Mount. When God Takes You to the Mount to the mat. What do you think that, that phrase means? When you, when you take somebody to the mat, what, what, do you, what, what's, what comes to mind when you think of that phrase? A pin and wrestling. Okay, you wrestling and pinning, yeah. Um, it, it does have wrestling connotations. Spandex. What? Spandex. No, that's a wrong answer. Spandex is not a right answer. <laughs> um, uh, and looking it up, the phrase um, has been around a good long while. It means to fight until one side or another is victorious. As in the governor said, he'd go to the mat for this bill. It comes from wrestling and it evokes that idea of grappling with an opponent. When both contestants are down on the mat, the padded floor covering, that, is, uh, that has actually been the name of a wrestling mat since about 1900. It's the idea of grappling. Leonard Sweet said this concerning prayer, because we're, we're talking about two things tonight. We're talking about wrestling with God and when God takes us to the mat, but we're also talking about prayer. Leonard Sweet said this concerning prayer. Far too many of us, uh, for far too many of us, there are only two attitudes towards prayer. Those who pray their way in and those who pray their way out. Most of us, unfortunately, take our prayer lives most seriously when we are trying to pray our way out. you agree with this? You think that's an accurate statement in general? Not, not every single time, but... I think it's an accurate statement in general. We are more fervent and passionate, not when we're trying to pray our way in, but trying to pray our way out. Generally, I think it's, it's true. Generally, I think we're, we're passionate in our prayers when we're in crisis mode, as opposed to having that passion for prayer when times are good. Tonight... We have an objective to see how God revealed himself to Jonah, exposed Jonah's sin, taught Jonah about himself, and drew Jonah back into a right relationship with himself. The, though Jonah is the one who is focused on in chapter 2, everything in chapter 2 was about God working in Jonah's life. And through this chapter, we see God working in his life. And he works to bring him to repentance, but also to learn some incredible lessons and insights about prayer. It's amazing the things we're able to learn about prayer when it comes just to this particular passage. So tonight we're looking at four lessons God makes clear when he takes his children to the mount. And by the way, when, when God takes you to the mat, how much of a wrestling match is it? It's not much of a wrestling match, is it? You know, it's like, um, you know, if, if, you know, son, if a you know, son and, and a father wrestle, but the son's like two years old and the dad's going down and going, all right, let's go, think. God, when he wrestles, he doesn't play games. God's not intimidated 
by us. He's not impressed by our strength, not scared of our punches or actions we might take. Jonah threw himself into the water. God used it to get him straight. Notice four lessons. Number one, we have the lesson of who he is. Who he is. Jonah 2, verses 1 and 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress. And he answered me out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice. A surprising thing happens in chapter 2. We, we began this whole, uh, this whole uh, series talking about Jonah in Jonah chapter 1, about the whole book. And some people actually believe that Jonah was actually written as a comedy because there's some humorous things going on. Everything is listening to God as opposed to Jonah. The prophet of God hears from God and says, nope, I don't want to do that. The people who were in the boat who were godless, they were crying out to God. The winds obeyed God. The fish obeyed God. Jonah didn't care one bit. But here in chapter 1, or verse 1 of chapter 2, something surprising happens. It says, then Jonah prayed. By the way, that's a sad point, humorous point, if you want to make it. It's a learning point, but it's a sad point when the people of God, when they do what they're supposed to do and people are shocked by it. People ought not be shocked when Christians act like Christians. Instead of fleeing, Jonah was seeking the God that he ran from. Now, it says that Jonah was in the belly of the fish. Let me say a few words about this. There have been myriads of pages written trying to answer that question. How did Jonah survive in the belly of the fish? I have heard sermons. I have read articles. There has been a whole mess of stuff written. But it's interesting what the Word of God does. The Bible wasn't interested in explaining things but simply takes it on faith that God could do what he did. There's another lesson in there for us. Is do we need everything explained or do we have that faith that God simply can? When we're faced with terrible circumstances, are, are we focused on why it can't be resolved? Oh, no, we can't do this. This can't happen. This can't happen. Or are we saying, you know what? God can deliver here Jonah is experiencing all of which God had laid out and he came to a full understanding of who God is. Of his power, of his might, of his ability, of what God wanted him to do, of the things that he had did, done wrong. Jonah understood it. There wasn't a question in Jonah's mind. It's interesting, the couplet of words used by Jonah. He said, I called out... And he answered. But where did he answer from? He said, I called out where? In my distress. It's written that Jonah cried out from the belly of Sheol. Sheol was the deepest depths. It's the opposite of the highest of heights. Tell me how I've ever been on, a, on an emotional high in your life before. You haven't? You know, I, I know you have at some point in time. What's, what's been an emotional high at some point in time? The wedding. Day. Wedding. The wedding is like, woohoo! It's, it's an emotional high. You're in the highest of heights there. What else? Finding out we were pregnant. Finding out we were, yeah, we were pregnant. Grace was coming. That was a, yeah, that was a high of highs. We were like, woohoo! And then we got it verified like 14 times. <laughs> um, after that, when a, when a child is born, wedding day, when you get great news, cancer-free, things like that. That's the idea of the highest of highs. Sheol is the opposite of that. It's the lowest of lows, of sadness, despair, hopelessness. It's linked to those that are dead. The idea of a, a place that the only person that can offer hope is God. And it's interesting, again, even there, God heard. 
Notice two things. First, Jonah had a look at me when I'm talking to you moment. You ever had those words said to you? Look at, it, look at me when I'm talking to you. It's not a very pleasant thing to, to hear, is it? You ever seen a mom or a dad grab a hold of their child and their child is like glued to the TV and just glued to a screen and, and they've got their kid and they take their kid and they're look, their kid's looking that way and they go and they like have to forcibly turn their head and then it's kind of funny, you, you, you refrain from laughing because you know they're in trouble, but then their eyes are just like looking over on the other side. Jonah had one of these moments where God was doing everything he could and saying, look, look at me when I'm talking to you. You got all these distractions. You got all these things that you're saying, well, what about all of my choices? And God's like, no, no, you're not going to have any of that. I'm going to get you focused on me. Notice the things introduced into Jonah's life brought him to focus properly on God. The, Jonah didn't have any distractions. He had pain, he had all of these things going on, but he didn't have anything that he could focus his mind on except on God. I'll give you a weird thing. When we go on vacation, when we're at the beach, and like we're walking on the beach, it's one of the things we, we love to do, especially um, either in the, in the spring or fall when we're there. We'll walk down the beach. One of the things, and I don't know, well, I do know why, but it's kind of one of those crazy things. I keep getting sermon ideas and illustrations popping in my head. And they're good. I'm like, why well, can't I do this in the office? We're just walking. And I'm like, oh, man, I could, oh, I could preach that. I could do this. You know why? It's because all the other stuff that I might have to do or responsibilities or, hey, I've got this appointment or no, all that's faded away. I don't have any of that other background noise going on. For so long, Jonah had all these choices. Well, I'm going to go on this ship. I'm going to associate with these people. I'm going to go and spend my money this way. I'm going to do all that. And God's like, all right, I'm going to take all that away. You're going to look at me and me alone. God took all of Jonah's choices away except who he cried out to. He had a lot of choices. Where he could go, who he could talk to, God says, I'm going to take all those things away. You ever seen a basketball player have his arm in a sling? And with that arm in a sling, it's probably on his dominant hand. The idea is that he wants to improve dribbling on the non-dominant hand. You go in and that's the only hand you can dribble on because this one's, yeah, that one's in a sling. It's fine, but it's in a sling. The idea is you want to focus on what you've got to work on. That's what God was doing here, saying, hey, hey, Jonah, you got a lot of things going on in your life. Guess what? You need to focus on me. You know, in the, in the midst of all of this, Jonah did something else. Jonah demonstrated the universality of prayer. He demonstrated the universality of prayer. Think about it. Jonah was in the ocean, in the belly of a fish, and God heard him. God heard him. He prays. And we understand it's good anywhere. Two truths. First, you may pray to God in any location, in any circumstance, for any reason. Nothing is too small, nothing is too insignificant, and there is no such thing as a bad place to pray. By the way, that's a great lesson for any of us, but children especially, that nothing is too small or insignificant, but also to Pray not only for big things, small things, but pray anywhere. Pray in the hallways. Pray on the sidewalks. Pray in Walmart. Walmart needs prayer. <laughs> you know, there's never a bad place to pray. But also this, even though you have rebelled against God, 
and are fleeing from his presence, you can still pray in desperation and seek his deliverance. Jonah was in the midst of rebellion against God. He was doing all he could, and yet God heard him and delivered him. Jonah understood who God was. But notice also this, second little truth. What he was doing. What he was doing, it was very clear to Jonah what God was doing. Verses 3 through 6. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea. And the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. Yet I again shall look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head. At the roots of the mountains I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought, me, uh, brought up my life from the pit. O oh Lord, my God. This is a very personal passage. Jonah understood something, that if God had thrown him into the water, it was God that was going to get him out. By the way, did God throw Jonah into the water, or did he not? He basically did the crew threw Jonah in the water. Yeah, the, the, the idea of the physical hands. You could say he had Jonah yeah. thrown in the water. Yeah, yeah. So the idea was God knew what was going to happen. God knew what needed to happen. So yeah, the sailors, they, they threw him in. But God was orchestrating it and saying, listen, there's chastisement that's going to need to come. I need you in the water. Jonah knew what God was doing. He was punished. Yet God was faithful in going to rescue him. Verse 6, Yet you brought up my life from the pit. Notice some amazing things. God used the object of Jonah's punishment as the vessel for his deliverance. Jonah so often. How many times have you heard a prisoner say, you know what, I found God inside of jail, inside of the penitentiary, inside of my, uh, in, in the time of my incarceration. A vessel of punishment was the vehicle of redemption. Just because it brings pain doesn't mean that it's all that it brings with us. Notice also, most of the time, God allows us to choose how we learn, and often we choose very poorly. Most of the time, God allows us to choose how we learn, and often we choose very poorly. How many of y'all have ever gone to uh, the hospital or the doctor's office and they've asked you that question? How do you best learn? Is it through visual? Is it by writing stuff down? Is it showing? How many of y'all have ever had that before? And yeah, I, I mean, they, they, they ask that to you. God does the same thing in our life. There's a myriad of ways for us to learn the things that we need to. There are there's the word, there is sermons, there are listening to our moms and our dads, our friends, our rules, the laws, common sense that is around us. But how many times do we ignore it? How many of y'all ever learned anything the hard way? Anybody you're like, woo, sign me up for that again. We don't like learning the hard way, but sometimes that's what has to be done. Jonah here was learning the hard way. Many times we've got the easy way in front of us, but we choose very poorly. Had Jonah gone to Nineveh, the whale wouldn't have, or the, the great fish wouldn't have been necessary. But he chose how to learn his lesson poorly. Notice also God's punishment of Jonah shows that God's ear is always able to hear our prayer. Jonah was in a bad spot. But God was there and available. Even in the midst of being punished, God was there. Notice two things. Even as we suffer under God's discipline and punishment, we can pray to Him and know that He hears. Don't you hate, hate it when somebody gives you the silent treatment? Ain't that a worse? 
You know, you're like, I want to make up. I want to do this. I want to, I want to talk to you. And they're just like, mm, not going to say anything. Um, a lot of times I'll text Allison and in texting her, I wait and 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 my phone never, you know, gets a text back saying, okay. And I'm like, oh, wait. And so a lot of times I'll just like call or I'll message, I'll do something. What? Because I want to know if she's got it. If I knew she's got it, I didn't care about, you know, getting a message back or anything like that. Same is true of God. When we're going through stuff, we want to know, God, are you hearing us? God heard Jonah in a place I guarantee you had zero bars and zero self-service. It is a reminder that yes, he hears. We also see this, God answers prayer even when you are at death's door. Jonah was in a bad spot. His initial plan in getting over on the end of the water was, this is it. Jesus, I'm going to come and meet you. But even right there where he was at, God heard him. There is no situation so desperate that God cannot swoop in and bring salvation and help and hope. God made clear who he is what he was doing, but he also made clear how Jonah and how we messed up when we takes us to the man. Verses 7 and 8, when my life was fading or uh, fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you. Into your holy temple, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. Notice in Jonah's prayer, he talks about his error, and he describes it, and he understands it. Two things. First, Jonah abandoned God. He abandoned God. He said, I remembered the Lord. To experience it. Huh? You got to experience it, but you got to forget it, right? If I, you know, your car keys, or your keys, if you, uh, if you remember where they are, first thing you got to do is you got to lose them. You got to forget them. Uh, the other way in, in a, you can set up a, a time to remember is you can be so distant from it, it's not on the forefront of your mind. I'll give you an example. Carolina Beach Boardwalk. What is the one thing that comes to mind when I say those words? Fred's Donuts. There you go. <laughs> That's one thing. Amen. Uh, how many of y'all have had a Brit's Donut? Maybe you've had one, I bought you one. Have y'all had Brits Donuts before? Oh my goodness. Okay, we'll put that on the prayer list. Um, now that, that's Carolina Beach, I think it was uh, 1938. It, it's a donut shop at the Carolina Beach Boardwalk. It has some of the best donuts. It's won like competitions all around. Um, it is absolutely wonderful. People go there just for that. And for those that do not remember it, or those that, you know, have had it, most likely you weren't thinking about it until I said it. It's a difference if you're having it every single day. I mean, I had coffee this morning. I wish I had coffee this morning. It's on your forefront of your mind, right? I still haven't finished my full cup. It's still at the house. It's still got about that much in it. I had a big cup. Um, when something's on the forefront of your mind, it's not about remembering because it's always there. Jonah had drifted away. He had to bring the Lord back to the forefront of his mind. The lesson for us is God should never be that far that we have to remember him. He's there. We might remember a facet of him because his, his goodness, his graciousness, his faithfulness, it gets renewed in our mind, but God is always there. But notice also, Jonah remembered the one source of hope and strength that he'd never that had never failed him. He went back to what he knew would work. And how often is that true in our life? Anybody ever tried a new food, like a, a new brand of mayonnaise or um, a different type of mustard or, or something like that? You tried something different and you're like, why in the world did I make this choice? 
the memories come to mind. Why didn't I buy the Duke's mayonnaise? Um, Jonah did that. Jonah went after a bunch of other stuff, and what did he say? What did he find? He had to go back to that which had never failed him. He abandoned God, but notice Jonah relied on false idols. He relied on false idols. I know what you're thinking. Wait a minute. Jonah wasn't bowed down to some carved idol, and he wasn't. But you know what? He was relying on a lot of other things. His wealth, his health, or excuse me, his, uh, his wits, his money, the distance he could put into God, he was relying on himself. It's just as much of an idol as a bronze statue. You know, the idols that Jonah was running after were a lot like the ones worshipped today. Wealth and health, knowledge and prosperity. Jonah made himself an idol and forsook a lot. Um, it's an interesting phrasing. Um, forsake, um, make sure I, I say this correctly in, in the translation that I have because it was actually kind of interesting reading about this. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. Some people have looked at that and said, wait a minute here, we need to, we need to translate that a little different. To not forsaking, or rather to say it is forsaking the grace that God has given. They were looking at it and looking at the wording and looking at the way it is. And it was an amazing little thought that it was a, the idea of abandoning all of these things and running after idols and saying, God, I don't want your grace anymore. I want to rely on, on something else. His error was relying on everything except God. Notice, praying to God means forsaking other gods and other objects of devotion and sources of hope. That's something we, we have to examine in our life thoroughly because it's so easy to begin leaning on things other than God. That was how we messed up. God makes that clear, but also he makes this clear. Why we should worship. Why we should worship. When God takes us to the map, mat, we know why we should worship. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah uh, out upon dry land. There's a huge change from Jonah running to Jonah worshiping and Jonah praising. Once he, he didn't want anything to do with God, now he sacrifices and thanks God. And he does it because God has been clearly seen and he understands some things. Two things. Number one, because God is God alone. It was crystal clear to Jonah that God was the one with power and might and goodness and grace. It was all of God and Jonah wanted to make it known. Notice, when God answers prayer, we should respond in thanksgiving and worship and give an offering to him. When God moves, other people ought to know. And there ought to be something in our life that gives back. We do it elsewhere in this world. When we're out at a, at a restaurant and we just get amazing service, don't we, don't we go in and we just tip a little bit more? We're like, boy, this person is, they Johnny on the spot doing everything. I'm going to give a little bit more there. I saw a little video when Shaquille O'Neal, the retired basketball player, he was talking about how he goes to a restaurant. He tips big. And he, he is like a big tipper. And, and he usually asks the waiter or the waitress, he says, how much do you want? And he said, the most somebody has ever asked for is $4,000. And he said, I gave it to him. I was like, my goodness. I need to go get a job when he, wherever he's going <laughs> Here's the thing. I, I know it's a bad analogy. But shouldn't the world see us respond when God is good? 
You know, it's not, it's kind of tipping, but it's not. It's responding and saying, Lord, you've been so good. You have answered prayer. I want the world to know. He gave the reason of because God is God alone, but also because God alone has salvation in his hands. Salvation belongs to the Lord, as it says in Scripture. Jonah knew nobody else could get him out of it, and no one else did. It was God in God alone. Deliverance has its ultimate source in God. Let me give some practical applications. Things that would help our prayer life, our, our life to stay on track, and to also help anybody that might be wrestling with God. Number one, list every reason you have to be grateful to God and give Him thanks for each item on the list. How long would that list be if we listed out all the things that God has given us and we're grateful for? Foot, two feet long. How, would that list really end? I mean, we, we, we couldn't fill it up. We just got everything. We would be right that for the rest of our life. Here's the point. The point is not a complete list. The point is 2020 vision. To see the world with grateful eyes and lips that continually praise God for what he's done. You ever, uh, you ever been with somebody that, uh, that really is, uh, is really great at history? Allison's uh, uncle is really, really good at American history. And we were walking around Fredericksburg and driving around Fredericksburg, Virginia. And he saw things different than I saw things. You know, I saw old buildings, I saw statues, I saw different plaques, I saw different things. I, that's what I saw. But as he was looking around, he was like, oh yeah, that statue is erected to so-and-so in, uh, in so-and-so a time, and he was the one that did this. He plotted out all this stuff that you see. That building over there, now that's important. That thing's been around since 1801, and... It did this and that, and oh yeah, and this over here, you look out over all of this, this over here was the embattlement, and this right over here was where this got bombed. He was seeing things on a whole different level. When our hearts and our minds have that connection to God, saying, Lord, I just want to be grateful. The things that we look at in this life, it just looks different. And we'll be thankful from everything, from the air conditioning that we enjoy to the good roads that we drive on that might take us 20 minutes to go a mile. But praise God, we can drive on. Also, no matter how dark life may seem, do not give up and pray to God for help. No matter how dark life may seem, do not give up. Pray to God for help. Jonah did it. But I'd like to give you a more uh, contemporary example here. There's a movie called The Blind Side. Anybody ever seen the movie The Blind Side? Sandra Bullock's in it. Um, she won, a, uh, I think, an Oscar for it. It was a, about a family that took in a uh, basically a homeless teenager that ended up being a, a tremendous football star. And the, the characters um, were Leanne and Mike. Um, Leanne was the mom. Mike was this kid that was on the street. Big guy. And this is the scene that gets me. This is one of my favorite scenes in all of movie them. There's a scene where Leanne's taking him in and like, she knows he's going to be, um, he's going to be staying with him for a while. So she's like, all right, I got a bedroom. I'm going to make this thing up. She's going through and she's like, hey, here's your chest of drawers. You put stuff in here. There's your desk. You can do your work there. Closet's over here. I've got you a bed. And you're a big guy, so I've got you a big bed and all that. And she's showing him around and he's looking at it and he asks her, he says, is it mine? And she says, yeah, it's all yours. He says, I've never had one before. And she says, oh, you've never had a room to yourself. And he looks back and says, no, a bed. And it just, it hit her to the point where she had to leave the room. 
when you think about it, the situations that go through in life. You think about Jonah, the belly of the fish. You think about Mike. Now, I'm almost 18. I've never had a bed. And their life got turned around. Never forget. No matter how dark life may seem, do not give up. Pray to God for help. Final two things. I'll be done. Search for objects of devotion that have become false gods in your life and get rid of them. At communion, there's a call to examine ourselves. The same is true in life. If something's trying to push God off of that first place in your life, go, wait, no, out of the way. And finally this, remind yourself of any promises you have made to God in the past and do your best to fulfill them. Jonah ends with saying, I will pay my vow. A vow. It's, a, it's a powerful statement. It means saying, listen, God, I made you a promise. I'm going to do my best to fulfill it. We need to also pay those vows to God to follow through with God always. As we close, questions, comments, observations on Jonah chapter 2. Let's bow our heads as we close tonight and uh, ask the Lord to bless all the lesson that we have received. Father, thank you so much for your word and how it speaks to us. I pray that all those that are here, all those that are listening online have been, have been touched in some small way by your word, by the lessons we've learned. Lord, I thank you that no matter how bad things might get, we know that there is a hope in you. I pray now that you would help us. Help us to remember these words that we have heard tonight, that it might help us to bless others, to bless our own lives in the days ahead. For it's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Turn our live feed off. Thank you for everyone listening on live feed tonight.